Hi, my name is Bill Kinney, and this is part 22 of my series about parametric curves. I feel like parts 0 through 21 has really been a prelude to what I'm going to start now. Now we're going to really get into using parametric curves, in particular, to model the motion of something particular, in this case the trajectory of a ball. I'm calling this Modeling the Trajectory of a Ball Part 1 is a sort of a subtitle to this thing. I'm going to continue to emphasize the key facts from calculus that I haven't derived, I, I haven't focused on trying to understand why these things work, but I'm assuming that they do work. I'm using Mathematica to help me visualize this. The key facts emphasize, first of all, is that the velocity vector is the derivative of the position vector. The speed of the motion is the length of the velocity vector, and all these things are functions of time. And the distance traveled can be found via integration of the speed function. Ultimately, these are the key facts. I'm trying to keep these videos about 10 minutes. I'm not exactly sure how far I'm going to get in this video with respect to this um, modeling of the trajectory of a ball. I'm sure it's going to take more than one subpart here of this overall video series to really get into depth about this. I am going to be following more closely now uh, sections from the second edition of Multivariable Calculus by John Rogoski. I've been not really following those things. I've been using some of his notation, but one thing I've done that hasn't followed the order is I've introduced the idea of a vector fairly early here. Don't be scared off if you're in pre-calculus or calculus one or two. I will still focus on things that might be helpful to you. Ultimately, if we have to do calculus computations and you're in pre-calculus, I'm going to typically leave those kinds of calculations that I show you the details of toward the end of each video, so hopefully you can still get um, the main ideas from most of the video. All right, here's our example that we're going to spend uh, at least a few videos on. The trajectory of a ball is modeled by some parametric equations. Okay, here they are. Parametric equations, T is the parameter, that's the name we give it. It is time, and the key thing to realize here is x and y both depend on time. x is a function of time, y is a function of time, and I am basing this on some actual physics, um, some physics principles about free fall to get these equations. I can also use, uh, I can combine these functions into one point value function that I call c of t in this way to show you that the, the point itself as it moves depends on time. I'm assuming distances are measured in meters and time in seconds and the ground is representing y equals zero. I could also add that um, you're going to be at the origin at time equals zero. I might as well add that here. And you are, the ball is at the origin. You can figure that out by plugging t equals zero into these functions when time is zero. All right, our tasks are to, use, first of all, use Mathematica to create a graph of this parametric curve, as well as graphs of the coordinate functions f and g, and the graphs of the distance as a function of time, distance traveled from time zero to time t, and the speed at time t. Ideally, we do this in a grid meaning in Mathematica we're going to use the command called grid to actually put this in a, a square, ultimately, as I've done in recent videos. And part B, we're going to determine some physical things. How long is the ball in the air? Where does it hit the ground? What's its maximum height? And how far does it travel, both total and as well as horizontally? And what are its maximum and minimum speeds? I'm sure I'm not going to be able to do all this in this video. In fact, in this video, I'm going to try to get as far as I can with Mathematica in 10 minutes here to do this first part. You know from some previous videos that I've recommended uh, trying to use commands in Mathematica in a modular way, meaning separate things out so that you don't get too confused. But in this video, I'm going to try to get, see how far I can get without modularizing. I'm going to try to do part A here all in one big command and then we'll break it apart into pieces and see, think about how we could modularize it. All right, let's see how far we can get here in about uh, five, six minutes. So first of all, uh, let's just enter the functions here. I'll go ahead and make this bigger so you can see it hopefully better. So first of all, here's the syntax for entering functions. 
f is going to be the name of the function for the first coordinate. As a function of time, you use square brackets. You put an underscore after the variable. That's essential when you're defining a function. Colon equals is not essential. You could just put an equals, but I like to put a colon equals uh, for reasons I won't get into. x as a function of time is just 30t. That's a pretty simple function, 30t. What about y as a function of time? The function g is going to now be defined. Go back up here. That's this function here, 19.6t minus 4.9t squared. And if you know any physics, you should know the reason for those strange numbers that are used. I'll go ahead and define the function c of t as well as a point valued function. That'll be, um, yeah, combine these two functions into one, f of t comma g of t. Notice again, when I'm defining a function, I put the underscore, but when I'm using the function, I don't put an underscore after the t. Okay, so this is gonna be fine. The semicolons just suppress the output, though you wouldn't see the output for these things anyway, um, but it's a habit that I'm in to separate different lines of code. All right, so those are going to be the functions. Let's just get a, an idea of what the overall plot looks like first with a plain parametric plot. I'll just type in C of t. Actually, we can answer the, one of these questions pretty quickly just by thinking about it. How long is the ball in the air? Uh, if you think about it, that's going to be, it's going to be the, in the air between time equals zero and time equals some positive time when this function here is going to be um, back down to zero, and you can factor out a t and write the function like this. And if you set that equal to zero and solve for t, it y equals zero when t is zero, that's at the start of the motion, and when this thing is zero, which will happen if you think about it when t is four. So this is going to be in the air for four seconds, that's the easiest thing to answer. And we can see the graph, there it is. That's going to be the path of the motion of the ball. We don't see the actual motion yet, but it's the path that it follows. And we can answer a second question pretty quickly. How far does it travel horizontally? It travels, it looks like 120 meters would be the answer to that. That's the way it looks at least. Okay, I want to make an animation for this. So let's put this within a manipulate. I need an animation parameter. You see the up arrow there telling me manipulate needs an animation parameter after that parametric plot. I've typically called it B because it represents the right endpoint of the interval that I'm plotting this over. That's why I've called it B. And you need to pick something just barely bigger than zero, the starting value of T when you plot use parametric plot. And we're going up to four, and then we're going to replace this four with the animation parameter B. This is going to make an animation. Um, it's not going to be ideal. There's one more thing I should do to make it ideal. Why don't you think about what I could do to make this more ideal? What's going to go wrong with this? Well, it's not really wrong so much as you're not seeing the whole picture all the time. It's kind of fun to look at. We need to keep the plot range constant. We don't want to animate the plot range. 0 to 120 in the horizontal direction. I forgot how high it went. Let's try to just try 0 to 20 here. I think that was the picture we had before. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good at least. There we see the path of, of the motion. And already this is a pretty accurate representation of the motion in terms of how fast it's going. Now it's a little hard to tell. It looks like maybe it's going at, at a constant speed for all we can tell here. I believe, well, it should be actually slowing down as it reaches the peak a little bit. It's hardly discernible. And speeding up as it comes back down again. It's going pretty fast at first, slows down, then speeds up again. That's ultimately what we should see with the speed function. Um, let's see, let's end this video by starting the grid. Starting to put this in a grid. Grid will make grids of plots, for example. So this parametric plot, notice the syntax here, you've got the grid, square bracket and an ending square bracket over here. The parametric plot is inside there. We've got curly braces like this. I'm ultimately initially trying to make a grid where I've got this plot on the left side of the grid and some other plot after the comma here on the right side. That's the syntax here. And what other plot do I want? I want a plot, a regular plot in fact, of the y function g of t 
as a function of time. I better pick a plot range for this too. We're plotting g as a function of time here. Its horizontal coordinate, which is t, should go from 0 to 4, because that's what time is doing here, going from 0 to 4. And its vertical coordinate, it would make sense based on the other graph, should go from 0 to 20. So this is the beginning of a grid. It's not the entire grid that I'm ultimately going to make here, but for this video I'll stop. Showing both the path of the motion on the left and the y coordinate as a function of time on the right. The, the graph on the right is not the path. That's graphing the y coordinate as a function of time. Now ultimately it would be nice to have the scales on these axes be the same. And in the next video I'll try to fix that too.